Hello, this is Galactic Gregs coming to you from uh, the night of Elon Musk Starship presentation. And my analytic summation of tonight's presentation uh, is, wow, it's like the space age just got started. I mean, holy smoke. Think about this. This is just like everything that's happened in space to date has been a few Viking longboats coming to America. Now here comes the Carnival Cruise Lines. Holy smoke, it is so different. It is such a departure. I said before that if uh, this thing worked even partially to Elon Musk's uh, expected uh, capability, that it would be a game changer, an absolute game changer. I must say that if it works at all, it's a game changer. And if it works a fraction of what he uh, projected, it's beyond a game changer. This is like the whole new universe in space exploration. Why do you say that, Greg? You're talking crazy stuff. Well, compared to what we've done before, this is crazy stuff. I mean, uh, one starship has the launch capacity of a thousand cubic meters, like the entire internal volume of the International Space Station in one launch. And to top that off, it's got uh, 150 metric tons of, of launch capability per launch, 150 tons each launch. And he's talking about building a fleet of these, building them rapidly, and having maybe 10 or 20 of them. And I say, he, he, he's talking about flying these things like 10 times, four times a day. He said, hey, if I launch 150 tons, uh, four times a day, 365 days a year, he's talking 10 of these vehicles putting up one and a half million tons of payload in a year. And a one launch being uh, on par with, the capability of all the rockets on Earth launching at one time. The entire launch capacity for a year uh, is the way Elon Musk put it. Uh, I have to go back and double check these numbers. I'm reporting this just right after he talked. It's like, holy smoke, I, I want to get this out here fast. It's like uh, such a game changer. If, if, big if, if you can pull all this off, there's a lot of big ifs in this, of course. And uh, it's a very optimistic plan, of course, but that's cool. Uh, he's built this. Uh, MK1 uh, Starhopper, excuse me, uh, his first uh, Starship uh, prototype in like four to five months. And he built it outside. You know, I was going in the previous video asking him, gee, what are you doing building this thing outside? Aren't you worried about contamination and blah, 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 blah? Well, being a stainless steel, it's a lot more robust and that's true. And uh, it, it doesn't require the precision well, it's easier to work with the stainless. Lots of advantages of stainless. I've got some stainless plumbing outside and the wreckage of my. DCX rocket. It's pretty amazing stuff. It's set outside for uh, over a decade and it looks like it was just dumped there. <laughs> uh, Greg, what are you doing with DCX rocket? Yeah, I'll talk about that in another video in the future. In any event, so um, this thing, he's talking about this. He's talking about in uh, one to two months flying the MK1 to 65,000 feet. One to two months. He's talking about the MK3 uh, start building that in a month, and he's talking about three months flying it. MK3 in three months. And he's talking about MK4, four months. And apparently MK4 is the one he's talking about going to orbit. He's talking about having orbit in just six months. Six months to orbit with a vehicle he hasn't even built yet. Six months to orbit. And he's talking about having people on orbit within like uh, a year. People on orbit within a year for this brand new Starship design. Wow, if he can do that, and you know, it's he's still, you know, somebody asked him in the Q and A, said, well, "Are you still planning to put a hundred people on this thing?" He said, "Hey, you know, it's got a thousand cubic meters in space. You can utilize all six surfaces because it's not like you're, you you can only use one surface to stand on. So it's a lot of space." Uh, people ask him about life support. I, you know, I think he, he talked about recycling atmosphere. There's a lot more to talk about than that. Uh, he didn't really directly answer how he was going to do it because he was asked, are you going to use existing systems, regen? Uh, well, he did say he wanted to do regen. Um, but he didn't go into detail about the process. So that tells me that's still in his uh, design space. So they're still working that which means there's, there's some room for, but you see these guys, they, they keep changing starship design on the fly. Uh, the time they actually start flying, every model is gonna be different. That's why they do the Dragon. And uh, that's why they, they do the Falcon uh, vehicles. They change them uh, every time they fly. 
uh, they have a, a rapid response uh, a change rate at SpaceX that uh, nobody's ever seen in aerospace. So it, it's pretty amazing what they're able to do in that context. Uh, so when we're talking about uh, flying people within a year, uh, it's, it's amazing. So, and this whole thing of flying uh, one and a half million tons in a year on 10 boosters. Well, he's talking about building several boosters. He's talking about building as fast as he can build them. And obviously he can build them fast. He's gonna have two production facilities to do it in, uh, both in Boca Chica and at the Cape. And he's planning to expand them. He's planning to expand them considerably. So uh, th this is just a game changer. So it's, you know, I'm, I'm, my socks are kind of bluff. I took, a, I took a whole notebook worth of notes here. So just going through them and trying to, to get some of the high points is pretty amazing. But he did say some things. He had some quotes that I really loved. And uh, his, his quotes, uh, schedule, on schedule, he said, I like Norm Augustine's, you know, old adage that, hey, uh, you know, schedule always slides to the right. You know, that's an aerospace type adage. And uh, Colonel, uh, uh, anyway, I'll skip that. The, the other thing he's, that Elon said, though, is schedule. He said, if it's too long, it's wrong. If it's too long, it's wrong. If it's tight, it's right. Man, I love that. Wow. wow. What a game changer. It's way diametrically opposed to uh, the way it's been done in aerospace, which follows Norman Augustine. And then there's the other old adages that, you know, uh, work always expands to, feet, to meet this, you know, available schedule or contracts, you know, for whatever the launch date is. Uh, and another uh, quote that he had was that the, the best part is no part. The best process or procedure is no process or procedure. I mean, you know, that is a radical thinking. It sounds kind of like the, the best government is the small government, <laughs> Thomas Jefferson. Uh, so the, uh, the process that they're following, the rapid turnaround, the rapid build, uh, wow, this has never been done in aerospace. It's, it, it's so off the charts. Uh, let's hope that he can succeed with this because if he does, uh, it's going to be like nothing we've ever seen. It's like the whole space age really is just about to begin. Uh, I hope he can pull this off. And so, uh, hey, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Bezos, are you uh, taking notes, sir? Uh, you might, you, can you keep up with this guy? Most people are going, where's Bezos at? You know, well, he's off in the corner somewhere. He's either really doing something revolutionary or going, holy smack, I wish I'd have seen this before. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I really hope that he's got some really good competitive concepts and this secretive new Armstrong vehicle that he's reported to be coming up with will be on par with Starship or maybe beyond. <laughs> so, but, you know, these capacities I was talking about here, 150 metric tons, one, one and a half uh, a million tons per year, that's with the version one of the Starship, the version two with a 58 foot diameter uh, <laughs> payload section, vehicle being that wide, is going to be mind boggling. I mean, again, if you can just like stack houses up inside the thing. So uh, that is way off the charts. And is he gonna build them like that? Now I've seen a pres uh, uh, presentation by uh, a friend of mine, Bob Zuber. Bob and I both have had the uh, distinction of having both served as executive uh, uh, excuse me, as the chairman of the executive committee of the National Space Society. And he went on to found the Mars Society. But um, he, uh, he uh, has come up with a presentation, a concept for having many starships and a regular starship uh, servicing them. And these things going to Mars on a regular basis. But, you know, I really think that the, the bigger starship is probably the better idea because it gives you more mass, which is better or radiation children, which can be very crucial for astronauts on the way to Mars because uh, the, the, the cosmic rays, gamma rays, all this stuff out there in space, is, especially the cosmic rays, is just going to fry people's brains if we don't protect them. And you need mass for that. Of course, your water that you take up, your fuel, uh, all these things can contribute to the shielding that's available to you. And, and in addition to the, the shielding that would probably build on the, to the spacecraft itself. But we have to have adequate radiation children. And we really need some type of gravity system. You see all these pictures of this thing. And then he had this wild picture they presented tonight. And it was this. Holy smoke. 
that's pretty wild. Now, I don't know. Of course, the artists always show things uh, burning every time they show a rocket engine. We know that they fire them like a bullet and they coast for most of the time. But a uh, starship to Saturn? Well, <laughs> pretty fanciful idea. I don't know. Maybe uh, uh, nuclear thermal or nuclear electric propulsion or something else. So light cells might be the, the way to do that. But uh, they're certainly thinking big, no doubt about it. <laughs> No bad at that. So, uh, of course, this is uh, Elon tonight at the base of uh, his MK1 Starship. And uh, it, it's just impressive that he got this thing out. And I love the look at this thing. Look at this thing. It looks like we imagine spaceships looking in the 50s. This is really it. Finally. Oh, my God. Finally, the 50s has got here. <laughs> they start dreams. Now, of course, it even has a, it's complete with a battleship look of, you know, the riveted together uh, hull sections. But of course, as Elon explained tonight, this was built from uh, sheets of stainless that literally they had to weld together, whereas they're going to unroll uh, the bigger parts for, for the subsequent spaceships. So they won't look quite, uh, like, quite as much like shingles uh, bolted together. But uh, in any event, I, I think the whole thing is awesome. And it's going to be a lot lighter weight than this. This, of course, is just a demo vehicle. It's not the operational vehicle. This is a vehicle to, to shake out a lot of the concepts. And uh, so, um, I, you know, I'm just, I'm impressed. I, I, like I said, I got literally pages of notes here. And there's no way I'm going to go through them all right now. I might do another video on some of this stuff. But the cool thing is the launch rate, the launch capacity. Uh, how fast he's building these vehicles. Uh, it's just mind boggling. I'm sure you, you can find his videos and there's gonna be tons of other commenters uh, commenting on this. Uh, I do think he has some challenges though. And uh, the challenges, I don't know, I got so many notes here, I've been past it. But then what the main challenges, as I see them, uh, one's gonna be his heat tiles. Now, stainless is a whole lot more forgiving than carbon composite or aluminum, but those things melt it like, you know, you know, a couple of hundred degrees, uh, you know, just a few hundred degrees and they're, they're nothing. Uh, whereas stainless uh, can take on uh, quite a bit more, I think it's 1500. Uh, the, uh, it's far more robust. So it doesn't require as much in the way of heat shield and heat tiles. Now he's talking about heat tiles, kind of like the shuttle used. The heat tiles in the shuttle were very problematic. They had to be each one individually inspected after each and every flight. If his tiles require anything approaching that he can't achieve the kind of schedules he's talking about. He might go back to his uh, uh, using his uh, cryo film cooling if uh, that's the case. However, uh, since the stainless is far more forgiving, he, he's free to use much lighter, thinner, more robust heat tiles. I know he's already flown some on the recent uh, Dragon. So uh, it's possible that he can get there with his new approach. I hope so. Uh, because then he will have to uh, expend some of this propellant. Of course, there are some masks that are being tied up in, in heat shields, but I assume that's a lot more efficient if they are robust enough. I mean, he's talking about no refurbishment practically uh, and, and turning these vehicles around and flying them like an airliner. Uh, in aerospace, that's revolutionary. It's never been done. Now, he didn't make, make mention of his Falcon 1 flight and how he thought he could just parachute in the water and reuse it. I was there when he rolled out the Falcon 1 at the Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. And uh, I saw it and I talked to him initially this first time I met Elon. And uh, I looked at that booster and I looked at the engines and the wiring and how it was all built. And I go, no. <laughs> it was all way too chintzy to, to survive that kind of a robust hit that you take dropping in the ocean. I mean, go back and look at some other videos and you will see that I've been out in the ocean launching stuff and I know when stuff hits salt water, it's messed up bad just by the salt. Electronics are fried and everything is just corroded and coated with salt and it's awful to deal with and you got to get it off and it destroys circuit boards, boards instantly on contact. So the, the salt is nasty messy stuff in the salt water. Plus when you come down and hit it, you hit it hard, you, it tears things up. I've also had the privilege of working first stage on the old Aries booster con, uh, program and and having seen what happened the space shuttle boosters and how the how the systems tunnels were, were ripped apart on some of the re-entries and splashdowns, uh, the forces involved in that water, how it can form jets and you make a little design change, the impacts can be huge and enormous. 
So I seen that. So I knew that there were some problems involved in that. So I was glad to see him trying to land on the deck instead of splashing these things in the water. Although he did do some of that work. And I actually supported some of the analysis on that for SpaceX uh, based on what I had done at sea before. And so um, I've done a little bit of that on the side. Uh, that said, uh, and I was, I'm happy that I got to support their program, but it was just a tiny little bit, just a little bit of work. But in any event, uh, so there you have it. Uh, they do have some challenges. Uh, the boil off, he kind of, he kind of played that off. Uh, that he, I think that does require some more. He, Jeff Faust asked him about uh, the approval that he had to go through to get just the star hopper to fly, how involved that was. Now he's talking about just flying all this stuff and ask him how he was going to do it. And he kind of made light of that. Uh, he said the FAA is helpful and, you know, he's happy they're working with him, blah, 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 blah. And maybe he's got the relationship started. Maybe it'll click through. I don't know, but that's very optimistic. And I can understand where Jeff was coming from with that because I was wondering the same kind of thing. And uh, I, too, have flied, uh, applied and, and gotten launch uh, uh, waivers to, to launch some of the rockets I was launching. I went to the FAA in Washington, D.C. for some of that and then filed uh, my, uh, my launch waivers with them. Also, I worked with Eglin Air Force Base because I did most of my work out in the Gulf of Mexico, except for one that went out on the Atlantic Ocean prior to that. So I've been through some of these procedures. I've dealt with some of these things, and yeah, it's pretty enormous. But maybe he's got the, the cookie cutter out now and can punch it a few times. I mean, I, you know, we kind of got there with what we did, too. So it's a possibility, but it's not to be taken lightly. Uh, life support is not to be taken lightly. Uh, I do think we he need some kind of gravity environment because the first time you send people to Mars, there's not going to be somebody to take the guys off the spacecraft and put them in wheelchairs. I mean, you've got to come up with some way for the people to be uh, rehabilitated or habilitated before they leave the vehicle or to be able to operate even within the vehicle. Uh, so you're going to have some robots up there <laughs> to take them off. You, you need something in, in any event. But I do think maybe two ships, two to three ships on the way uh, with, with uh, some tether method. I've seen tether and trust concepts for this. Uh, two and three ship type ideas. A lot of people do some of these things out. Something like that really needs to be considered. So this view I've got here of one ship by itself going out somewhere. Uh, it's a nice artist concept, uh, but I don't think that's the way you want to fly them. But that's just me. That's an artist. I, I'm somewhere different. But look at this. This is really cool. Uh, I think it's all just super amazing that uh, they've taken this approach and uh, what they're doing is beyond game change if it succeeds. Now you can see my other videos, I've talked about what might happen if it don't succeed. Uh, I asked the question, is uh, SpaceX about to nuke Boca Chica? Now let's hope that's not the case. And of course I know they wouldn't do it intentionally and he did mention tonight that he's trying to buy the guys out and he said it would not be pleasurable thing to be there in Boca Chica when he's launching these. Let's put it lightly. He said the risk was small, but he didn't, he said it was not non-existent. I give him some credit for that, but the truth is the likelihood may be very small, but the consequences could be catastrophic. So let's hope we don't see that. Sometimes, you, you know, there's two parts of risk. There's likelihood and consequences. You, you got to look at both sides of it and how they weigh together. And uh, so that's how you look at that. I don't know exactly how small it is. Uh, he has his projections, but you got to consider these are vehicles that have never been flown. These are operations that have never been done. Uh, and it's, there's a lot of fuel involved here. Like I mentioned, the N, uh, NK-1 booster in, in Russia that exploded on the July the 3rd of 1969 through debris, six miles. Up to Chica, just two miles from the launch pad. So buck chickens, take musk money and run. <laughs> I still think that's what you need to do. Uh, any of it. So I hope I hadn't gone too long here. I'm just kind of at all, uh, there's, uh, there's just so much to digest and I want to get this video out fast because uh, uh, it's just such a game chamber. So let's all wish him the best and hope he can succeed because if he does, the space age has just begun. And with that, thank you for watching.